Welcome to Staying Connected, a podcast where I talk to other people about their stories with FEDS or vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Staying Connected. This is your host, Katie, and before we get into the show, I want to remind you that the views, information, and opinions in these podcasts are those of the individuals involved and do not represent the opinions of the Marfan Foundation. The Marfan Foundation is not responsible for and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in them, nor does the information constitute medical or other professional advice or services. This show is not produced by or affiliated with the Marfan Foundation or the VEDS movement. I am so excited to welcome you back to Staying Connected for the third season of this show. It's been a really incredible experience to talk to you about your stories with VEDS on this podcast for the last four years, and I'm really feeling the momentum of these growing connections in our community. This season, we're going to talk to five people about their stories with VEDS and one of the wonderful physician researchers in our community, Dr. Shane Morris. New episodes will be released every other Saturday until June 11th, when the final episode of the season will air. To kick off the season, we're going to talk to Heidi Green, who lives in New Jersey and whose nine-year-old daughter, Isabella, was diagnosed with VEDS. Huge thanks to Heidi for sharing her story on the podcast and raising awareness with us by sharing her daughter's experience and her own experience as a parent raising a child with this condition. Let's go to the interview. Hey, Heidi, I am so excited to have you join the podcast today and share your story. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. So you have a daughter, Isabella. How old is she? She just turned nine in October. And when was she diagnosed with VEDS? She was diagnosed April 12th of uh, 2021, last year. So fairly recent. Yeah, that is fairly recent. So how did that, how did that come about? It was like a long process. So uh, Isabel is a twin and at 30, at 33 weeks, her water broke. So I didn't go into labor right away. I was, I went into the hospital and was on hospital bed rest for that week. And they were hoping that um, just to give them a little bit of extra time in there. So then they delivered at 34 weeks. And initially, like she came out and she looked around the room and I even like watching the videos, like the doctor's like, wow, look at her big eyes. And she's so alert. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And so they uh, they were both in the NICU for about three, three weeks. And I just remember her eyes were so big, but my eyes were really big. Um, Her skin was really thin, but she's a preemie, too. So. Uh, I think at the time I really didn't think much about anything. And then we brought them home from the NICU. And I think shortly after bringing them home, they both had lots of GI issues where they would throw up all the time. Uh, They had a hard time like drinking their bottle and I was pumping and bottle feeding them. And my husband and I would kind of like team up, he would take one child and I would take the other. And I just remember like, as soon as they finished just like a little bit, the second we turned them, they would just come straight out. And the pediatrician said, you know, it's normal, you know, there's, don't worry about it. They are, they're growing, they're hitting their, they're on the curve. So even though they're hitting like the minimum weight gain, they're still gaining. Um, and there's no need to be concerned. And I think it was more that they thought that having twins was overwhelming. And I know like having twins is, it really is overwhelming having t- taking care of two babies at the same time. It is overwhelming, but it was kind of harder than normal because to get them to gain that, you know, half a pound or the one pound, it was just so much work to get them there. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until, you know, I would say, you know, know, there, she, uh, she cries a lot. She has a hard time like sleeping. Um, She has a, she never, they never really took to solids or purees. Like they're all those milestones that kind of would come naturally. 
she wouldn't, I remember her, like her reflexes were so sharp. I would just try to come in with like the puree on the spoon and she would just like grab it <laughs> and like, whack it <laughs> or like turn around, cry and like vomit. <laughs> oh no. So there was a lot of that. And then it was a bigger practice. So I think we got to see a few of the doctors in the practice and we would explain and they're just like, "What? Well, whatever you're doing, just keep doing because they're gaining and all that kind of stuff. And then it wasn't until their one year checkup when we went and we got to see another doctor at that practice that she uh, raised some really uh, like the raised the red flag that no, they're not where they need to be. They're really low on the curve, uh, borderline failure to thrive we should, they're going to be behind in speech and OT and they're going to need all this stuff. And so at that time, I think it was really frustrating because for the entire year I was going in and like pretty much in tears, like I didn't know what to do with them. We started at another pediatrician practice and he put us in touch with a gastroenterologist and uh, feeding therapy. So we did that with both of them. Um, But I always felt that there was something more with Isabella. Mm -hmm. So I think Jackson, yes, he struggled with eating. He would vomit. Um, There was the constipation issue as well. But with Isabella, it was like, like two notches more. And there was the bruising, the translucent skin, um, the vis- it was like very visible. She developed a uh, umbilical hernia and all these concerns when I would bring them up, they were like, by the time she turns eight, all this stuff is going to be like resolved. That hernia is going to be an innie because she was born so early that that's probably why you see the skin. She didn't get to develop the fat that goes underneath. And then I should say that they, at the time of her birth, she was diagnosed also with intrauterine growth restriction. So they essentially think that she stopped growing in utero at 32 weeks and then her water broke at 33 weeks and then she was delivered at 34. So I think they tied a lot of her having a little bit more of issues to the fact that because of her being such a a preemie. Yeah. So it's easy for them to say like, yeah, all of these things are happening, but she was a preemie right. and that just happens with preemies and not look into it. Right. Right. Pretty much. Now the twins, they're, they're not identical twins. No, they're not. Okay. They're internal. Okay. So then we, we did the feeding therapy and they said she likes probably GERD. Uh, she bled easily and bruised really easily. And I remember her maybe, maybe she was like two and she got like a little paper cut. And I tried to just kind of like, I put pressure on it and the napkin was so full of blood from just like a really tiny, such a tiny like cut. And I was like, well, that's, that's really odd. Like, do I need to take her to the hospital because of this? Or um, I brought it up and like all the blood work would come back, like nothing really there. Fast forward, we finished feeding therapy. They started growing a little bit growing and like meeting their mile markers and everything like that. We make a trip out to California to go to Disney. And during that time, she just had a small sinus infection, but it went into a streptococcal pneumonia and she was hospitalized. And it was a real, like she already had her near death experience then. Um, How old was she? uh, She was five. I want to say five turning six. Wow. She was vaccinated for the, she, she did have the pneumococcal vaccine. Um, The infectious disease doctor came in and um, they couldn't figure out what was going on essentially. And when they found out that it was streptomonia, her labs were all off. I remember he told me when you guys get back to Jersey, follow up with an immunologist and have her do, uh, have her see a hematologist because I think there's something off there. I can't pinpoint it, but it would be, he recommended that we follow up. Mm-hmm. So um, we did that and they pulled titers and they just, I don't know if it's beds related or not, but then when they pulled the titers, they saw that she, even though she was vaccinated, she never developed the antibodies to the vaccine. 
And now did they do like, did they test her for Von Willebrands or anything like at the hematologist office? Yes. Um, so when we saw the hematologist, I brought up to him that she's, she bleeds really easily. I'm noticing blood in her stool. It was like fresh blood. Um, and he said, all right, well, we'll do a Von Willebrand panel and we'll test some other things and figure out kind of take it from there and see what it is. So when all the blood work came back, it was within normal range, like nothing, there was no flag for Van Wilderbrand. Um, there was some other stuff on there, just kind of like her white blood cell count was high, but it was just probably everything coming off of having that infection. And he just said, you know, just be thankful. You have a perfectly healthy daughter. There really isn't anything there. And so we kind of like let that rest and had her like, you know, kind of recover from that episode that we had in California. And then after that, I just kept noticing like the blood in her stool and she turned eight. And all these things that I was told were kind of resolved by then had not. And I just thought like, maybe, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe there isn't anything there. And it's just, I'm trying to find something, but I couldn't, I just knew in my gut that there's just something just doesn't, isn't right. Like did the problems with her brother resolve by this point for him? Yeah, I think, well, yes, for him, it wasn't like he had stopped. He didn't like throw up with every meal after like that kind of like weaned, weaned off. Um, he's a better eater, like all those like things that kind of you would expect he would age out of it. It happened with him, but it didn't necessarily happen with her. Um, and there was always that extra factor of, I think the translucent skin, which I don't know how much, like, what does that even mean? I I don't even, I don't even know what uh, that's how she was born maybe. But I did notice that even if the seatbelt, if she would wear, put the seatbelt on, the seatbelt would leave like little petechiae, like little red tiny roots on her neck. It, a Band-Aid, if the second I take the Band-Aid off, they would be bruising from the Band-Aid. And even like now that I think about it, I remember just the NG tube that she had in the hospital left her with a big bruise mark on her cheek. Mm just like very fragile. And I like now everything makes sense. But at the time, it was just kind of like, so I think it was like last year that uh, around maybe this time last year, I thought to myself, I'm like, I need I need more answers. In a way, I, I feel like there's more to it. So I went to the pediatrician, and I said, Listen, maybe I am crazy. Maybe it's just a series of coincidences. Or maybe there's something more, but I really think we should like do some genetic testing and find out if there's something other than that. I honestly was starting to think maybe it's Marfan, but she doesn't have the other characteristics of Marfan. Yeah. What made you think of Marfan? Like, had you heard of Marfan somewhere else or? I had started nursing school. So I had looked into Marfan and uh, she's very tall too. So I was like, oh, maybe like. Maybe, and I saw that it was like a connective tissue disease. So I thought maybe that might be it. Just kind of just trying to figure out, I had not heard of VEDS or all these years, I, it wasn't ever on the radar. It just wasn't there. I would have never thought, I, would have even, I wouldn't have even known to ask the doctor, could it be VEDS? Because I just didn't, had never heard of it or met anybody who had it. Yeah. So what did the pediatrician say? Like when you came to them and said, okay, can we do genetic testing? Like, I really think, I don't know if I'm crazy or if there's something else here, but can we do this? What did, how did they respond to that? I think at that point I had exhausted her. Uh, I think she was just tired. (laughs) It was just like, okay, fine. We'll just, we'll just do it. Even though like in all my years of practice, I just, I really don't think that there's anything more than this is just who she is. So she referred me to the geneticist and they did testing. And in that time, I just, and I, I don't think 
before, I don't think like in like the years past, I would never, I didn't want to do a Google search for symptoms because, you know, you Google search symptoms and it's going to be like, you've, you have cancer. So I didn't want to, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to avoid doing the Google search. Um, but I just plugged in her symptoms. Like she sleeps with her eyes open. She, I sleep with my eyes open and I, I don't have beds, but I just put in, like she sleeps with her eyes open, translucent skin, easy bruising. And the first thing that came up was vascular Ehlers-Danlos. Wow. And then I found the link to Annabelle's challenge and I clicked on that and there was pictures of people who have VEDS and it was like, oh, this is exactly, they look, they look more like Isabella than Isabella looks like her twin brother or especially the pictures of how, um, how it looks like with the skin and the eyes and all that stuff. And when you read, it was just, I saw like the checklist kind of the minor features and then the major ones. And literally it was like, check, 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 you know, motion sickness, sleeping with your eyes open, easy bruising, translucent skin. It was all there. It was all there. Now, is that after you had gotten the, like you were waiting on the results from the genetic test? Yes. So how did that, how did that feel? Like what, what went through your mind at that point? I kind of felt like this is it, but also in denial and at the same time, no, no, no. Maybe I'm just kind of like overreacting. Maybe I'm, I'm overthinking it in a way. And I just kind of like put it off, try to kind of like shove it in like the backside of my head and kind of, well, well, let's wait and see, maybe let's wait and see for what the genetic testing comes back. And initially like I was crying and sobbing and my husband was just like, just wait, wait until you wait until we have confirmation. It may not be it. And, you know, you can't type in symptoms into Google and this is what you're going to get, you know, you're going to get the worst <laughs> scenario. Um, I told you not to do that. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, when the genetic, I called the geneticist, you know, at that time when they, we were expecting the results and they, they had to did a micro array and uh, she was like, yeah, that's, uh, there's nothing there. And on this test, everything looks good. And I was like, yes, the connective tissue panel though, what does the connective tissue panel say? <laughs> um, and she was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna put you on hold. I'm gonna get the genetic counselor on the phone. And I don't like, I don't even know what happened there when she put me on hold. I think, honestly, I think I collapsed and Kevin walked in and, um, and he took the phone um, to try to speak with the person. Um, that was the genetic counselor. And she said, yeah, so the, it did come back positive for the col 3 a one gene. And it, it is con it's a confirmation that she does have vascular EDS. So they scheduled an appointment for us to meet with the, to meet with them the following day to get the, I wanted to get the paperwork and, you know, at that time, I reached out to Annabelle's challenge, uh, Jared, and he called us right away, which is great. He was so supportive. And he put me in touch with Francis in Texas. And she was just so much support there. Um, kind of was just like, well, you know, it's okay. You know, it doesn't, there are variations of beds and you just got to know kind of what the outcome really varies on what kind of mutation she has. So what else did the geneticist tell you? And I was like, I don't know, like there's, uh, I have no idea. So she was like, when you go in, ask for the paper, you know, she told me exactly what I needed to do and look and find out if it's spliced. Cause that kind of, you know, 
um, is the more severe one. So we walked into the office and I'm like, give me the paperwork. <laughs> um, I, had, I like looked at the paperwork and I'm like scanning it for like the type of mutation and it's like splice, 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 splice. Um, and that was another punch to the gut too. And when I asked like, what does this mean? Like I asked the geneticist, can you put us in touch? Are there any other families that have this mutation in New Jersey that I can reach out to? And he was just like, no, uh, I don't have any other families that have this mutation type. And it wasn't, I just, it was maybe like the first time that were the first family. So there wasn't really, we didn't really have that many resources. Um, or he, I don't know, it was like the guidance wasn't, I didn't know where to go from there. Thankfully that Francis, you know, connected me with the VEDS movement mm -hmm. and the, the Facebook group and other families from across the United States that have it and our parents that have it. And I just remember when we met with the, the geneticist and I said, what, what about us? Is it possible that I have it? And I just didn't know that I have it. And he said, no, because at your age, you would have probably experienced something by now. Hmm. Did they do genetic testing on you? Yes, they, okay. so they tested myself, my husband and Isabella's twin brother, and it was a, a De Nuovo mutation. Okay. So it's a new one that just happened. How did that feel connecting with other families? I would say it's one of the main reasons that helped us push through, especially in the first few months until now. Um, I still reach out for support from other parents, um, in particular Rachel in Texas and Abby. They've been really amazing as far as kind of helping me and um, or I'll say, Hey, you know, I'm not sure we're going on this trip and I'm not really sure kind of like what we can do. Like, what do you do with your kids? And they'll help us through. And I think just seeing, like, I think that maybe she's the only one in New Jersey that has the, this, the, the type of mutation that we have that we know of. Right. I feel that we, <laughs> just because we went through the genetic route and we just tried to find out what it was and that's how we happen to find out and maybe there are other people that have it and they just don't know that they have it yet yeah I think that's a good point I mean I think there are still a lot of people who don't know they have this right and you know I think it kind of feels like I don't know it feels like we're in kind of like this diagnosis wave like right. I more and more people are joining the group every day and it, and it just feels like it's being recognized more or it's like a coincidental finding more often in the genetic testing, you know, and I think um, to your point, there might be plenty of other people in New Jersey that have this and, and just don't know yet. And maybe we'll meet them. Yeah, exactly. And I think just kind of how far genetics has come in in the last five years, just even, you know, before that, it was hard to get approvals to get some genetic testing. And now you can, there are companies that can, you can do it on your own where you don't need to go through that, you know, go through the insurance route if, per se. So does Isabella know that she have has VEDS? Well, she, <laughs> she knows she is fragile. Because I had to, you know, we did all the, we did all the testing. And after that, I had to set up her scans at Hopkins and we were traveling as a family and she's eight and turning nine. So I think she has to know something, right? Mm -hmm. So I have to explain something. I can't just take her into an MRI machine and just be like, hey, um, <laughs> So she, she does know, she knows she's fragile and she has to kind of be careful with doing, going, like we are not doing rides anymore, you know, soccer, some contact sports that maybe she was into 
to pull away from that because she she might like you know bruise or get hurt things like that and I think she's very self-aware too of the fact that she does bruise easily and she does get hurt so I think a lot of her I think she has an an innate way of kind of self-protecting that has always been there so I think it was maybe last week that she said she goes mom what is what is my disability called and I was like it's called VEDS vascular eds and she was like hey siri and i was just like no do not (laughs) (laughs) yeah exactly so (laughs) i wanted to avoid that happening so i just said you don't want to google or ask an electronic device to give you answers because it has all the information and you, it's hard to like sift through. So we did start therapy Mm -hmm. kind to kind of like help navigate. I started first because I think in the beginning stages, once we got the diagnosis, I got really busy with creating her care team. Like I went to work and my days were really busy trying to make sure that um, we have a team at the local house at our local hospital, and there's a plan and reaching out to um, our vet specialists and kind of letting them know that we're on the radar and what to do and just get all that set up. And then once all that was done, I think it hit home that this is kind of real and it's our reality. And it, I had a hard time mentally dealing with it and you think that oh maybe I've gone through so much in my life that I'm conditioned and I can overcome this on my own and it's part of the process of grieving and all that but I realized that I can't do it on my own I need more support and sought um, some therapy and it's been really great because I mean, there's the silver lining of COVID has, (laughs) we've been able to uh, do telehealth therapy and our therapist is actually has beds. Wow. So who better to understand kind of what I'm going through and help give me guidance and like then, and knows really what it is than that person Yeah. You don't have a therapist kind of like telling you like you're being too anxious or that you're catastrophizing or something when the realities of VADs are so severe. Yeah, exactly. Um, And she's been incredibly helpful. And uh, Isabella also has her session with her every week. And even though it's not like, it's not VED centered, um, I wanted to give her that outlet, uh, want her to have that outlet of being able to vocalize and talk about how it affects her in, um, that's not me. Yeah. Like, you know, I just want, cause it, sometimes there's, you know, the parent and some, maybe you don't want to talk or say everything to your parent and that's okay that she has that comfort with somebody else that's going to understand because she, she does say, cause we had to pull her out of, she was in baseball. So he pulled her out of baseball at the time she wanted to do, she wants to go on like the highest roller coaster. We're like, mm, maybe not. Um, <laughs> and uh, working with her school also and getting, making sure like, you know, she's not involved in the contact sports. So she was just like, you know, I really wish I didn't have this disability because, you know, I can't hide it. Like I want to do stuff and I just, I don't want to, to have, like, you know, she feels like it's holding her back from just experiencing being a kid and stuff. So, so it's good that she has Mariah to kind of talk to and help her through that. And it's funny. She, um, she really loves Bethany Hamilton. 
And she's like watched her movies and she was like, wow, you know, she, I don't know. It's really, I can't believe like she went back in the water. (laughs) (laughs) I'd be so afraid. And I was like, yeah, well, you know, she didn't, she didn't let her disability take over. And I'm sure it's hard and it's hard every day to not have that be the center. And I, I, I have to work on it myself too to not see it as it's everything, it's part. And we did like, oh, she was eating French fries at the time and like the ketchup. So I just squirted some ketchup on. I was like, this is your disability. (laughs) And it's the rest of the plate. (laughs) Um, It will always be there, but you know, some days it might be really big and other days it won't be. It's not all of you, it's part of you. And that is something that I, I have to kind of work on every day as well as a parent, that it's part, it's part of our reality, but it's not everything. And we can still, you know, carry on and enjoy and be present in the moment. Yeah, that's wonderful. What are some of the things that you've really had to overcome as a parent of a child with this condition or some things that you're still working on overcoming? I think it's just the anticipatory grief, I would say, and being present in the moment. It's hard because when you, when we have such great moments and your daughter is your best friend, um, I want it, like, I want it forever. And, and it, it's hard because it's like, Vets is always like the elephant in the room. And I don't want it to rob me from it. It takes, it's a mental challenge to have, to not have Vets rob you from being present. Today, she's healthy, she's happy, and we're doing great. And it's just being present in that moment. And they say, like, oh, well, nobody's guaranteed anything. And, you know, you never know what's going to happen. You know, I may go out and I may never come back. And that's true, right? Nobody's really guaranteed anything. But when you have such a heavy diagnosis, it's hard to not have that be the forefront. Like, well, yes, but the chances are, and statistically, (laughs) that something might happen and the, you know, there's a greater chance because of this condition and then bringing it back to center and thinking about, well, there is no greater time. It sucks to have beds as um, one of the other moms says that she has her son, Abby. She goes, yeah, it sucks to have beds. It does. It sucks to have beds, but there is really no greater time. I feel to be introduced to beds than now because of, the VEDS movement because of genetic testing being so readily available. The trials that are starting, you have to hold on hope that in the next five to 10 years that there's going to be something promising for everybody that, that has this condition. Yeah. Yeah. That's a beautiful way to look at it. I mean, I think it's true too. You know, there's so much going on right now for VEDS that wasn't going on a few years ago even, and it does make it a hopeful time yeah. for the community. I think there, you're probably right. There has, hasn't been a better time to get diagnosed with this, even though it sucks. <laughs> like yeah, okay. it, It's a hard <laughs> diagnosis, but having, knowing that there are things coming up, yeah. I think makes it just a little bit easier. And I think the community is more connected than it ever has been before. I can talk till tomorrow about how how, uh, amazing the community has been. And it's kind of like, it's an immediate connection that you have. Um, And it's an instant love that you share with somebody when you know they're walking in your shoes and they understand and they've probably gone to several doctors themselves and thought to that it's just in their head or they're crazy or they're overreacting. Um, So you share similar stories and you share similar fears. And 
I think everybody from the individuals who are personally affected with beds to parents who are raising kids with beds to the doctors that specialize in beds. I mean, they're really just at literally a handful in the whole country, but you feel so connected that even though we're in New Jersey, I know that if I ever reached out to Rachel or Abby or you or anybody, you guys would immediately be there. And that is so comforting. And I am so happy that once Isabella knows more about what she has, that she has that community and the, the family really there and to support her through. That's so wonderful. Yeah. If there's something that you would, as a parting thought, want a medical professional listening to this or another community member who is just going through this diagnosis to know, like, is there, is there anything? I think for uh, medical professionals, I would say it's hard to think of something so rare because maybe they're so used to seeing stuff that is more typical and it's really hard to identify the atypical. And that is not to like, I, like, I don't blame medical professionals at all because I feel that everybody's really genuinely, truly trying to find the best care for the patient um, with what they know, but maybe dig a little bit deeper, especially because with how genetic testing has become available. You know, maybe if the Van Wilderpran panel comes back all fine, that maybe it's not just that child. Maybe just, all right, let's look a little bit further and further explore what it is because it really has, it really changes the outcome. Going to the hospital now, knowing that my child has beds, she has a better chance because I already know what she needs and that and also spreading awareness to emergency rooms because that is that is her first source of care is going to be through an emergency room. Mm -hmm. So it's you don't suspect somebody who's a teenager to go in doubled over that it's not like gastritis or just a stomach ache or maybe they had too much to drink or something but really like spot them. And especially if they have their beds card to get them to the CAT scan, because you want to get ahead of it, then try to trail, uh, catch up. Um, and I guess for parents, I would say, and I say this to myself, I wake up consciously every day and try to say this is try to be present in today. And hopefully tomorrow will be better because it's easy to not to think about all the worst things that can happen and have it take away from your moment and take steal you from your joy that you have with your children. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And, and thank you for sharing your story and Isabella's story on the podcast. Thank you. And thank you for being so supportive to me and my family. I really appreciate you so much, Katie. And I appreciate you spreading the word. Thank you, Heidi. This is sweet. <laughs> no, thank you so much. It means it means a lot to me to be able to do this. And it means a lot to know you and, and know everybody in the community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening in today and a huge thanks again to Heidi for sharing her story on the podcast. If you find this show helpful or informative, I hope you will consider sharing it with your friends on social media to help us raise awareness of VEDS together. You can also support this show by joining my Patreon at patreon.com slash translucent1. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on your podcast player and stay tuned for the next episode on April 16th. We'll be talking to Otto Nitschman in Austin, Texas. Thank you so much, and I will see you soon.